Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to MedTech Digital Week, brought to you by the producers of the face-to-face -face MedTech Summit, visiting Brussels in June 2019. My name is Alex Pierce um, from MDTI, and I'll be your host for today's session titled Managing the Transition to the IVDR. First, I'll cover some quick housekeeping items. If you if you experience difficulties with audio or advancing slides, refresh your screen with F5. If you are experiencing other issues, hit the question mark button to receive assistance. At any time during the presentation, submit your questions into the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen. In 24 hours, you will receive a link to watch the recording of this session. You can also download the presentation slides in the resource list box on the right side of your screen. Let's now begin by introducing our speaker, Richard Young, who is Managing Director of Acclaim Biomedical and also um, a MDTI expert and trainer. Thank you for joining us today, Richard. Now I'll hand it over to you to begin the presentation. Hello and welcome to this regulatory overview of the European In Vitro Diagnostics Regulation 2017-746. My name is Richard Young and I'm the Managing Director of Acclaim Biomedical Consulting uh, and you can contact me at my email address following this presentation at richard at acclaimbiomedical.co.uk if you've got any other questions or issues I can help you with. Just a little bit more about me. I'm uh, a microbiologist. I've been working in the medical device and in vitro diagnostic fields for over 25 years uh, in quality and regulatory functions with an emphasis uh, in the areas of risk management and process, valid and process validation, as well as the normal quality and regulatory side of things. Just gives you an idea uh, of where I've been. And I'm very experienced in the teaching of uh, topic areas within those fields. So on to the in vitro diagnostics regulations. Uh, it's a very exciting time within the regulations at the moment. We're going through a bit of a transition, and I think it's very important for manufacturers and everybody in the in vitro diagnostics field to have a pretty good understanding and appreciation of the, the issues and the activities that are going on in this area at the moment, because they can have an impact not only from the regulatory compliance perspective, but for the business as a whole, and some serious business decisions come out of this. So to really appreciate what the in vitro diagnostics regulation brings to the party, we need to think very carefully uh, about the major areas of impact. And I think really we've got to understand that the, the uh, in vitro diagnostics regulation is a major shift in the in the regulation of diagnostics in Europe. Uh, and in that context, there's a lot of areas we need to be considering here. I think the starting point we need to be aware of, um, which really, really does make a lot of change, is the risk-based classification of products. So that's going to lead to an extensive involvement of notified bodies into the regulatory compliance and the C marking of products going forwards. And it also brings in uh, some other impact areas uh, from the new regulations. We have the formation and the definition of designated reference laboratories by the European Commission who can be supporting uh, and, and sending products away to be sampled by these reference laboratories. We have the requirement for response persons responsible for regulatory compliance defined within the new regulation which is a very interesting uh, change very similar 
or in intent to pharmaceutical QPs, but really the first definition of the, uh, within regulations for the first time in in vitro diagnostics of a professional requirement for people who are going to work within the organisation and perform specific re regulatory compliance tasks such as manage product release, uh, conduct post-market surveillance and clinical evidence activities and so on. Uh, and across that, that is in common with medical devices and the, the, the definitions for responsible person are, are similar for both of them. Uh, both the in vitro diagnostics regulations and the medical device regulations also bring in the definition of unique device identifiers, so which are barcodes or RFID tags to assist with the traceability of products throughout the supply chain. Uh, and what we do see here, and this is a common theme in the responsible person and the unique device, UDI and the following idea here, the technical documentation, we see a lot of congruency between medical device regulation, uh, which is 2017-745, and in vitro diagnostics regulations in Europe going forward. So there's a lot of very common themes here and common approaches, very similar documents in many ways. Um, technical documentation for in vitro diagnostics, we have a uh, standard technical electronic doc a document like format and so a very prescribed way of organizing our documentation to support regulatory compliance required uh, by the new regulation uh, and we saw so we also see across both regulations but, but really specifically in the in vitro diagnostic side things we see the increased emphasis on clinical evidence uh, to demonstrate the utility of the diagnostic and its performance and so we have very close specification of those things now so clinical evidence and a gathering of it about the performance of our diagnostics is is extremely important and, and probably one of the major impacts from a cost perspective sort of going hand in hand with the unique device identify this barcoding, this traceability element is also a definition of control of what's called economic operators in the supply chain. So we're, we're defining authorised representatives and their responsibilities. We had authorised reps before, but now that's a lot more professional and tightly defined. And for the first time we see in the regulation, responsibility has been given to entities importing goods into Europe uh, and distributing as well. So there are requirements for registration and performance requirements for these bodies as well. So that this whole supply chain and traceability thing becomes an, of increasing importance. We have the EU Declaration of Conformity. Uh, has a bit of a makeover here really to reflect a lot of the elements of the UDI side of this unique device identification system and to really point at compliance uh, with other regulations within Europe as well. So potential impact areas will be things like the European batteries uh, requirements and so on, but uh, an envi other environmental legislation which will get drawn in to the declaration of conformity associated with your diagnostic. So that's an area we need to be thinking about. The regulation as a whole makes extensive use of central IT systems or UDEMED as it's uh, to coordinate traceability of activities and registration of manufacturers and economic operators uh, and people participating in the high supply chain as well as to be gathering data uh, about clinical utility in some cases displaying it for the public uh, and the, the background processing and consolidation about in, on information about uh, vigilance and, and, and elements of post-market surveillance so we big IT concentration here as well 
Interestingly, in the new in vitro diagnostics regulation, uh, in really reflecting the medical device side of things a lot more closely than previously, the concept of post-market surveillance and risk management are mandated as responsibilities of the manufacturer. So we need to have mechanisms to get proactively gather information from the market about the performance of our diagnostics. And we need to have a risk managed approach to the product life cycle. So we've got to really think about the risk management elements as, as, as well. And really as a corollary to the Udemed, the, the central IT systems we were talking about, we have this requirement for periodic safety update reports and for higher classification diagnostics, uh, these periodic safety update reports, which are generated by the manufacturer, will be published via uh, the central IT systems for the public to review. So we're getting a lot of themes out of this. We're getting traceability. We're getting responsibility. Uh, we're getting this increased involvement of the notified bodies who've got a lot of challenges of their own to overcome and requirements within the regulations. Um, so and transparency with our, our, our publication of clinical uh, information as well. So there's a lot of things going on here, uh, and it's it's a it's a big regulation with big impact, but it's trying to do so many things that the current version of the in vitro diagnostics directive really doesn't even try and address. So an awful lot going on here. Uh, more than we can cover in, in the time we have available, but hopefully this is going to give you a flavour of some of the elements that go in there and begin to get you to think about how you're going to move forward to a position of compliance with the new regulation coming forwards. I think one of, as I said at the beginning of the review of the the major impact here, the, the biggest one here we have is this impact of risk-based classification. The net result of this, as you can see in this diagram, is rather than about 20% of existing diagnostics under the directive requiring the intervention of a notified body, you know, the list A, list B products at the moment, there's a huge swing in in the in these new regulations where we're expecting 90% of diagnostics to require C marking through a notified body conformity assessment route and that's a massive change to to the industry not only for manufacturers that's a massive change for the notified body industry as well not many notified bodies cover in vitro diagnostics at the moment uh, and resources are going to be quite tight. So there's a not unrealistic expectation that, may, that you need to account for potential delays in conformity assessment of your products. Uh, if you're in a class B to D after you've applied risk-based classification, uh, potentially significant, significant lead times, uh, both in the development of new products and the certification of uh, existing legacy products from your portfolio to the new regulation. So portfolio products you've got today that are no, currently don't require a notified body are more than likely going to require you to engage with the notified body going forward. So there's that's a big change and we would really advise you to engage with a notified body as soon as possible to start the discussion and start the selection process if you don't already have a relationship with a notified body. Conformity assessment is based around seven rules uh, which are just hi highlighted in this flow diagram. And as you can see, the outcomes here, uh, there aren't very many that lead to the route of designation of a product as a class A device. Really, that only happens under rule five, where we're talking about uh, reagents, instruments and specimen receptacles. Uh, so really, if you're falling outside those definitions, as we've said on the previous slide, 
uh, rules one, two, three, four, six, and seven are going to apply to your product, and you're going to need that notified body to get involved in what you're talking about and, and getting involved in there. Uh, there are some routes to the high classification D uh, risk based uh, designations. And those are really from rules one and two, as you can see there. So if you're a uh, blood screening or high risk disease uh, diagnostic, yes, you're going to be in the class D. And similarly, if you're looking at blood or tissue compatibility issues, uh, you, you're you know, at least a class A, possibly a class D as well. And those are a fairly good reflection, uh, especially when you move on to reflect on to rule three. Those, um, those reflect really, in essence, the assays that were covered by the rule rules, the list A and the list B products in the current reg, in the current direct. So we have a transition period we're going. We've got these major impacts and we've got a trans transition period that's going to be happening, happening here. So the in vitro diagnostics directive is going to be moving to the regulation. Uh, and the first thing to note here is we have direct in entry into force. So there's no transposition period uh, into local national law. One of the results of this being a regulation, this is implemented European wide according to the transition requirements which are defined within the regulation. So no national law transition period. Um, the timeline for achieving this is very, very short. It sounds like it's quite a long way away with the end of the transition period being in 2022. But if you think about the amount of work that you need to do to look at your portfolio, conduct risk based assessments and, and gather evidence that may not currently be within your supporting documentation, time is pretty short there, especially with the potential considering the potential lead times to use notified bodies. So a lot of work to be done there in in a very short period of time. However, the regulation should result in a much more consistent application and approach to the regulation of in vitro diagnostics. So there's lots of a lot of stuff to be hopeful about there as we progress. So that gives us an overview of the regulation and that leads us on to just getting us some idea of the major bits and the structure of the articles and annexes that make up the in vitro diagnostics uh, regulations going forwards. As common with the directive, we're split into articles and annexes, the articles being the legal bits, the annexes being the the important bits of how you how you do things more the work instructions that go with the SOPs, if you will. And I think it's very important to have a good idea about the structure of the annexes. These are your working areas. Uh, and in common with the medical devices regulation, structured in a very, very similar manner. So you're getting the picture here. A lot of similarity in approach in the drafting of these new regulations. They've been drafted together. They were released together. They're designed to work as a set. So Annex 1 talks about general safety and performance requirements and sets down the expectations um, from a regulatory perspective for the design development and management of products under the regulation. Uh, this is incredibly important and is the basis of your declaration of conformity and it's important to have a very thorough understanding of this. Uh, this requires the application of risk management techniques and human factors usability engineering to the design and development of products through to labeling content requirements. So it's extremely thorough listing of the requirements, and really a move on from the essential requirements from the previous directive. Annex 2 talks about technical documentation and defines how we are going to store and present our documentation for review 
by notified bodies. It's recommended doing that in a, in a folder-based electronic system. We have technical documentation on post-market surveillance, which is very interesting. Uh, basically, this is saying there are mechanisms of post-market surveillance which are part of the technical documentation. So over annexes two and three, our technical documentation or technical file, if you prefer, is now a very live thing because it's continuously being updated with post-market surveillance information and reports which make the ongoing management of that data set of critical importance. Annex 4 talks about the declaration of conformity and the content of it. Uh, 5 about the CE marking of the device and how we apply it. And Annex 6 talks and defines how unique device identifiers and defines the information that will be required to be loaded onto the UDMED system to register UDIs with the Commission when that system becomes available. Annex 7 talks about the minimum requirements to be met by notified bodies. So part of this is notified bodies and their responsibilities and how they operate are being a lot more closely defined to really level the playing field uh, across the industry. Uh, and we're really expecting that those requirements and those hurdles are quite steep. There are a lot of requirements regarding uh, quality management systems, records, training, and the experience of reviewers and auditors within the notified body arena. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, there aren't that many notified bodies who cover in vitro diagnostics available now. So this is going to be, with these new requirements, certainly uh, a, a re resource restriction to the continued functioning of the existing in vitro diagnostic system in Europe. So a lot of things to be thinking about there. Annex 8 talks about classification criteria. So these are our risk-based classification rules, the seven rules I've already mentioned. Uh, a very important area for you to be looking at, especially with the view to examining your existing portfolios. Annexes 8, 9 and 10 define the various routes to conformity assessment, full quality assurance, type examination and production quality assurance, very similar to the requirements from the previous directive. Uh, and then we have definition of the content of certificates issued by notified bodies. And interestingly here, as a big change from the, the previous directive, uh, specific requirements on in Annex 12 about clinical evidence and post-market follow-up. And in Annex 13, interventional clinical performance studies uh, which may involve risk to the subject. So that might be additional procedures, delays or samples being taken uh, or procedures being performed on patients as part of the, uh, the process. Finally, Annex 14 talks about the correlation table, which links the current directive to the regulation on a clause by clause basis. So a lot of things to be thinking about there. I wanted to focus on uh, a little bit more heavily on the general safety and performance requirements within this talk today, uh, as this is the spine that runs through the regulations and is the reference point for the important elements of uh, compliance, which will ultimately lead to product being CE marked. So manufacturers need and developers really need to understand this from an early stage of the development of new products and how it's applied to existing products and portfolios. So as we've said, the general safety and performance requirements are the basis um, of conformity. And they're really, especially in the in vitro diagnostics area, a massive extension from the essential requirements that were previously required, especially in the area of labeling. We're really seeing the label content being a lot more closely defined uh, and, and a lot more content being required. 
Uh, it's going to be challenging to apply these retrospectively to additional products. I, I think in very few cases will there be no impact to existing product documentation. And in many cases, there will be requirements to do additional checks, validations, and produce additional data to comply with these. So a lot of work to do to comply here. Uh, and we should note here that this brings in the possibility of some cases of supporting products from an internet perspective. So internet documentation is going to be very, very important. So we've got this is a big impact area. We need to look at it very, very carefully. So having had an idea of the structure of the regulation, uh, and the important elements of the general safety and performance requirements. That leaves us thinking, how do we go forward from here? What are the areas that we need to be concentrating on uh, as re regulatory professionals or as business people? Uh, and where we start here is we need to look at impact assessment. I think that's a critical part of the story here. and planning is the starting point we really need to start planning now and think very carefully uh, about how we're going to proceed with existing portfolios and developments that are in process and we've really got to be aiming towards compliance with these requirements remembering especially from the your existing portfolio that uh, there's no grandfathering of existing CE marks into the new regulation. Each product will be examined against the general safety and performance requirements we briefly had a chance to review today, uh, really as new entities. So we've, we've got to assume here that you know, we're looking at these things anew and we need to look at them very carefully indeed. So the risk-based classification criteria are going to impact your portfolio. You need to look very carefully at the intended use of each of the products in your portfolio and look at the classification uh, that's going to be applied. And then really from there figure out, are they going to be require a notified body intervention? And in some cases, fundamentally decide whether you're going to continue with that product and bring it to market under the in vitro diagnostics regulations. Uh, I envisage, we envisage a lot of products exiting the market as well, on a basis of cost of compliance uh, and available time from organizations. So some serious business planning to be done there when we're looking against portfolios. And regulatory affairs and quality professionals within organisations are key contributors to this process for the interpretation of the regulation and so on. They shouldn't be looked at in isolation. This is really a teamwork thing uh, and we need to be talking to you know, other areas of the business, from you know, everything from manufacturing through to the sales and marketing groups to look at the future plans and strategies of the company complementary products and how they fit together into a coherent portfolio in view of the impact of the new regulations. One of the major areas we're going to be considering there is how much clinical evidence that we actually have for the product, how much it's going to cost to get that evidence for a portfolio. So where do we start? What, what order we'll be looking at. Using the relevant annexes, let's classify our devices. Let's go have the exercise. Let's go through existing products and apply a classification to them. Are there any significant changes in the conformity assessment or third party oversight requirements for that product? The majority of cases, I think the answer is going to be yes. Once we've identified that and made some decisions about our devices, we need to start collecting data about those. We need to have a very long, hard look at what's available uh, against the general safety and performance requirements for each of the products we've identified. Uh, and where there are gaps in that data set, we need to put process in place as soon as possible to begin collecting data, especially in the clinical evidence area. 
For those of you who are, have legal entities outside of the European Union, especially with impact on our labelling, we need to be considering our authorised representative. Who's going to represent us in Europe? And beyond that, for everybody who's distri distributing in Europe, as it's a manufacturer's responsibility, we need to verify our importing and distribution chain uh, within Europe. We've got to make sure we're dealing with the right people who are appropriate for handling our products. And really apply a risk-based approach to this to make some sensible decisions uh, and really having firm understanding of your partners going forward and good contractual relationships is central to that. Uh, which should be part of any good ISO 13485 quality management system. Um, and your systems approach with this is going to be essential for demonstrating compliance in all areas we've been discussing here. Once you know where you are, you need to go and talk with a notified body and you need to be discussing your timeline to compliance, how many products you need to bring ahead, and importantly, discuss, discuss with them when your notified body, your selected notified body, is going to be certified to the in vitro diagnostics regulations, whether they're going to cover within their skill set all the classes of product and types of products that you have in your portfolio, and what their timings are. And probably, very important to discuss what their resource levels are going to be like that. Are they going to have sufficient sufficient resources to ensure that your your files, your conformity assessment is processed in a timely manner so there's no interruption to your supply to market. Consider very carefully the definition of the person responsible for regulatory compliance within your organisation and decide which roles and functions are going to fulfil those requirements who, who are going to be who or who are going to be the responsible persons within your organizations note it doesn't have to be any one person but you need to have coverage of all the requirements of the responsible person across the organization maybe in several people there look at unique device identification and how you're going to manage that don't forget your label printing capabilities because often overlooked is the ability to print sometimes large barcodes into products so uh, unique device identification is going to be very important once established a labeling strategy should be fine but think about it very carefully there and think very carefully about the overall impact on European regulations on your global strategy uh, there may be products in your portfolio that you decide from the implementation of the regulation going forward that you will no longer sell in Europe but maybe sold in other places in the world and vice versa um, but there is an impact on global strategy for all organizations that needs to be thought out very carefully as we've mentioned here and I'll emphasize again don't forget your clinical evidence program it's going to be your major element of data collection uh, that you will need to start as early as possible uh, as in consideration of your product portfolio. Very carefully consider the costs of, of getting that data together. Uh, clinical evidence is not without cost. It can be an expensive undertaking in some cases. Look at it very, very carefully. And also look backwards. Don't, don't get hung up on your current uh, portfolio more than you have to to the expense of what you've got in development at the moment so materials coming through new assays new approaches that you're looking at the moment now uh, a clinical evidence program is something you should be start planning as soon as possible for these new potential new market entries so get on board with that as quickly as possible it's entirely possible that in certain assay areas, the availability of uh, patients uh, and platforms where clinical utility or clinical investigation work, clinical performance data can be gathered 
may be quite limited in some cases so get ahead of the game here and if you do need clinical evidence figure out how and where you're going to gather it because that could be a very very important part of your company's road for This has given you a very quick whistle-stop tour of the major structures and the regulations and some of the areas that we would want to be looking at going forwards. Uh, it's by no means co can cover the entire detail of that, but I hope you've got the idea from this. There's a lot of information in there and which we need to take into account and it can impact on a lot of areas, but concentrate on classification uh, of the devices clinical evidence and the compliance with the general safety and performance requirements so the starting those are the main focus starting points of the regulation that you need to be on board with uh, good luck in the future i hope you found this useful and here are my uh, details should you wish to get into contact with me after this session Thank you, Richard, for a fantastic presentation. Um, we've received a few questions already, but we'll give the rest of you a moment to enter your questions in the live Q&A box to the left of the slides. Before we begin the Q&A, I'll run through some brief uh, announcements. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors for sponsoring the event. Second, I'd like to quickly draw your attention to our face-to-face -face MedTech Summit with visiting Brussels in June of next year. And finally, be sure to check out the resources list to the right of your screen where you can download the presentation slides uh, from, from this session. So, now back to Richard uh, to begin the Q&A. And the first question I've got here um, is, how do you see uh, these changes impacting lead times to bring new products to market? Are you there, Richard? Uh, yeah, I'm here indeed. Thanks, Alex, for that. Uh, the impact on lead times is very difficult to quantify and is going to vary greatly depending on the classification and complexity of products at the moment. It's going to be very difficult to put a, a month and days value on that at the moment because we're not sure about the landscape of the and, and the level of resource availability in the market at the moment. There, is, there are no notified bodies who have been registered to deliver services under this regulation as yet. So we've got a very low level of and low and slow level of uptake. But if I'm going to model to our experience in the medical devices regulation side of things, where no, which is a moving ahead on the timeline of uh, in vitro diagnostics. Uh, we're already seeing quite major impacts just in the day-to-day -day activities of conformity assessment under the existing directive with significant delays uh, as notified body organizations are concentrating on getting themselves compliant with the regulations and training and recruiting people in to meet the resource needs. Um, and some of the lead times are significant already. Uh, for a medium complex product, I think you need to be looking from the point of sub submission, depending, again, as, as I say, on complexity. It might take you a year or more uh, in some cases for your products to actually go th get through the conformity assessment process and out onto the market. So very dependent on risk classification and complexity. Um, an unknown quantity, uh, difficult to put in a sign of value to, but we're pretty certain it's going to have a significant impact on lead time to market. Because I guess a lot of us are used to self-declaring these products, so that 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 step is has been minimal. That, that step's getting a lot taller. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, uh, Richard. I've got a second question here. Um, would 
you recommend the adoption of um, ISO 13485 to manage compliance with these uh, regulations? Uh, yeah, generally speaking, it, the caveat for that is that nowhere is it mandated that ISO 13485 is, is, is the quality standard that you need. Um, uh, and it's very clear from the regulation that one of the manufacturer's responsibilities is to operate a quality management system. No need to go and register or anything else like that. Uh, but I think it's fairly well recognized in the industry that actually having certification to that recognized standard is, is a very good starting point for an organization. Uh, I certainly think the regulators expect, while, while not requiring it, expect certification to those requirements. And the alignment between 13485 and the FDA requirements and so on is extremely good. So you're, you're hitting a lot of things at the same time if you've got that, that registration down and sorted. Uh, and if you're up to date with the 2016 version of the standard, the alignment of that standard with the MDSAP auditing requirements as well is extremely good. So while it's certainly expensive and it certainly is going to take up quite a bit of time if your organization hasn't been previously certified to a quality management standard, uh, I think it's the way forward. It's the easiest route to demonstrate a competence in the management of this regulated industry uh, and the smoothest way of engaging with that, you know, not only Europe, but the questions about U.S. regulatory compliance uh, and the NDSA P requirements for the wider audience there. Um, so, yeah, quite important. I'd certainly recommend it. And it's certainly more set up for for the regulated industry than something some other standard like ISO 9001. Uh, and I would expect most companies to be heading in that direction. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and I have a question here. How extensive are the clinical requirements for products? Right. Um, Clinical requirements for products are a lot more extensive than they were. There was very little requirement for clinical evidence uh, within the directive as it stood. Well, you know, many companies gathered it, but it, it wasn't a, a major cornerstone of the evidence activity that went with the product, especially no you know, post-market clinical follow-up uh, and gathering of uh, data there. Um, or post-market performance follow-up, as, as you will. Uh, but the emphasis has, has really come in here, and this emphasis on clinical evidence uh, is growing in importance. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, in various territories, even over the last few weeks, uh, media publications about the clinical evidence backing up the use of medical devices uh, in products uh, ac uh, across the med tech sector, uh, and I think clinical evidence is a is a very big part of that. And to a certain extent, I think the diagnostics side of the industry is, is suffered from a spillover uh, from the medical devices side, where the amount of clinical evidence that's been the basis of conformity assessment for medical devices has, I think, arguably in some situations, been inadequate for some pro products in some situations. Uh, and this is, this is really uh, an across life sciences approach to really raising the game on clinical evidence for all life science products. And it's, it's just a bigger jump, I think, for diagnostics than it is for other regulated products. Just, uh, just building on that, uh, Richard, someone's actually um, posted a question here. Do you expect new guidance to be published specifically for IVDA devices? I think it's uh, it's reasonable to expect uh, new guidance to come out from the regulators uh, over the whole course of the this uh, the implementation of these regulations. 
what in both regulations we we see the creation of a group called the Medical Devices Coordination Group, who are responsible both for in vitro diagnostics and medical devices, who are an expert panel uh, reporting to the European Commission to DG Sanko to coordinate uh, work on uh, common specification documents uh, and to publish guidance as required across the across this whole sector and certainly the conduct of clinical evidence gathering in in vitro diagnostics is going to be one of the areas uh, which is going to be uh, come under a certain amount of scrutiny we already know there's a meddev meddev 2.7.1 which is currently at rev 4 that talks about the gathering of clinical evidence that's a good starting point um, so yeah this is going to be an area we expect guidance but I would say here that um, guidance in a lot of areas is overdue in medical devices. Um, they're, they're behind schedule at the moment. So while I expect guidance to be published, uh, I don't expect it to be published soon. So this will be an extremely active area as, as the regulation implementation develops, but it's, 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 it's going to be a developing one, and it's very difficult to predict what the content or timelines for its publication are going to be at the moment. Uh, thanks for that, Richard. Uh, I've got a, a specific case uh, example um, or question, shall I say, now. Uh, someone's asked, the self-testing blood glucose meter falls under which class? Uh, B or C, uh, because according to the classification chart you presented, it should fall under class B, but in regulation is a little confusing in rule number four. Uh, just you, they're just asking if you could expand on that. Um, to be perfectly honest, the uh, the specific case. Let me um, get the. Can we come back to that one, Alex? And I'm just going to get up the relevant classification rules so I can look at the detail. We, we, then we'll take another question. I'll come back to that one. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 That's fine. We can also we can also answer that one and send it to the um, to send it to the attendees. We don't have to answer that um, live, so it's fine. Um, I do have another question here as well, um, and I know this is an interesting. I know this is a topic um, that. Um, you have a lot of opinions about. So what impact will Brexit have on this coordination group and the MDR? Ah, uh, well, uh, Brexit and the wonderful world of, of regulation. Um, look, it's very difficult to, to say what uh, impact Brexit will have on this. Uh, certainly both the medical devices regulation and the in vitro diagnostic regulations are in the agreed as common regulations in both in the UK and Europe uh, should the uh, legal bill that's been agreed at a European level actually come into force, uh, which would be a good thing. Uh, if uh, the UK leaves the European Union without uh, regulation, without um, the, the divorce bill being decided, uh, I'm afraid all bets are off and no, nobody's entirely sure what will happen then uh, with regards to that. The MHRA has been very clear in saying they intend to continue to follow the European regulation anyway, uh, which is hardly surprising because MHRA put a lot of effort into the writing of the new regulations. So they're sort of a bit, a, a bit invested in it. Uh, I don't see in effect, anything else happening going forwards. I think the C marking, the regulation is here to stay. It will apply to the UK as well as Europe. How it will apply in the UK under the various scenarios is extremely, uh, uh, extremely difficult to see. So a muddy pool, I think, is the answer there. <laughs> Lots of uncertainty. Um, yeah, so going back to the previous yeah, question, yeah, sure, we go for it. Let, let's have a look at uh, rule number four. So we're looking about a self-test blood blood glucose meter um, and, and whether it falls into B and C. Um, but it's regular. So we're going. To, we've been asked to look at rule four here. So rule four says devices intended for self-testing are classified as class C except for devices for the detection of pregnancy, for fertility testing, and for the determination of cholesterol level, 
uh, and devices for the detection of glucose, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and bacteria in unit, which are classified in class B. So it's self-testing products, which are intended for testing of glucose, amongst those other things, fall into class B under uh, rule, four, rule 4, clause A. Uh, is is my reading of that one? So yeah, so fa fairly fairly clue fairly clear through there. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Brilliant. Thank thank you uh, thank you Richard. Um, we don't appear to have any more questions. I will give you a couple of um, I'll give you a few more uh, give you a couple of minutes to, to see if there's any more questions you want to, to put to uh, Richard before we um, uh, close things off Okay, I think uh, yeah, we'll, we'll I think we'll we'll call it a day there. So, thank you very much, Richard, for a um, for a great session today, um, and thank you everyone for attending and posting questions um, to Richard. It's been uh, really really good to get to your feedback and uh, and get that engagement from you. Um, the session was recorded, so you'll receive a notification in 24 hours when the on-demand session is uh, available for viewing. I believe we'll also send you the, um, the slides in an email to all those who have attended. Um, and yeah, before you log off, please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve these, um, these digital week experiences for, uh, going forwards. Um, so on behalf of Connect365 Life Sciences, um, I'd like to say, uh, yeah, have a great day and thank you very much for attending. And thank you very much, Richard. My pleasure.